So welcome to the final video of this series on intracranial infections. We're going to talk about a couple of special infections here that have a distinctive imaging appearance. We've already talked about a couple of these other things, uh, so this is just going to be a few final considerations here that you might think about. If you missed these, uh, be sure to go back and check out those additional videos. So there are two diseases we're going to talk about uh, here in this video. One is cystocercosis, which is a parasite, and the other is uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, or CJD. Uh, so cystocercosis is, a, as I said, is a parasite, uh, can involve the brain. It has a life cycle that involves the pig. Uh, what happens is, is it infests the gut by eating undercooked pork, and then through water, which is contaminated by feces, you actually uh, can get the organisms within the brain. Uh, the treatment's antiparasitic agents, typically albendazole and some steroids, may also be used to reduce the edema. The outlook is quite good uh, with treatment. So on MR, what you tend to have is a cystic structure that follows CSF. You may have areas of calcification uh, that are dark on T2. You can have varying degrees of edema, which can correspond to different stages of the infection. On CT, you often get a thin-walled cyst, which may have a dot inside, which is actually the scolex or parasite itself. The wall of the cyst can enhance with contrast, either on CT or MR. Then you may have some surrounding edema. Now, the best clue that you may have is there may be old calcified nodules throughout the brain, which can be remnants of old episodes of neurocystocercosis. So this is uh, from the CDC. It's just a uh, pattern of the life cycle of cystocercosis. So it's a, it's a common myth that it's actually from eating contaminated pork. While contaminated pork does play a role, if you eat the contaminated pork and it infects your GI tract and your liver, what happens is the... Uh, the fecal uh, contamination of water actually gets ingested by the host, and that's uh, that's actually what goes to the uh, to the brain and eyes. Uh, so that's actually uh, super disgusting. Uh, cystocercosis can uh, have a couple of different phases, and so the appearance can kind of vary over time. With the vesicular stage being very cystic looking, so almost like just a cystic structure. Uh, when it gets a little bit more colloidal vesicular, there tends to be greater edema with an enhancing thick wall. As that starts to heal, you'll see the retracting wall and decreasing edema with a little bit of enhancement. And then the chronic tends to be just punctate uh, parenchymal calcifications without enhancement. So here uh, you have a case. Uh, this is a 35-year-old woman with dizziness and nausea. And if you look in the right frontal lobe, you see an area of edema. There's a central area of calcification there, so a little bit of swelling there. Here on the bone windows, you can see that area of calcification in the frontal lobe there. Here's the MR from that patient, and what you see is an area of edema, kind of as we saw before. Uh, you see a little T2 dark central area on both T2 and flare. And then on post contrast, you've got a little bit of a thin rib of enhancement here with a lot of edema. So with that calcification, that's something that's a little bit different from the abscesses that we saw. You really should be thinking about cystocercosis. Uh, cystocercosis can also involve the ventricles and CSF spaces. And uh, when it does that, it's called racemose or uh, grape-like uh, involvement. Here you have a patient uh, who is a 28-year-old man with headache on the slices through the lateral ventricles. You can see there's hydrocephalus with a little bit of periventricular venous edema. And if you come down and look at the fourth ventricle, there's the multi-lobulated kind of cystic lesion in the inferior aspects of the fourth ventricle. You see it better on this heavily T2-weighted thin slice image here along the inferior outflow tracts of the fourth ventricle. You see this uh, cyst, uh, cystic structure there. That's cystocercosis involving the ventricle there. Here you see pre and post contrast images from that same patient showing very little, if any, enhancement there. So you just see cyst-like uh, expansion of that fourth ventricle, but not really any associated enhancement. So CJD is another uh, unusual infection that you may run into. Uh, it's a prion-associated disease. Now, I will point out that 85% of them are spontaneous, meaning that they occur in patients who do not have a familial history and who are exposed to no infectious agents, so they weren't uh, exposed to contaminated beef. By far less than 1% of them are, are infectious, but that's what you hear about the most. About 15% will have a familial history of, of prion disease, so uh, that's a consideration there. There's a very long latency, so even if you're exposed to the agent, it can take a very long time, as in 10 to 15 years to develop. But once it develops, there's a very uh, low mean survival, less than a year. 
Uh, the symptoms that these patients get tend to be a rapidly progressive uh, dementia and sometimes movement disorders. Now, the imaging findings that you will see with CJD is hyperintensity of the basal ganglia, often bilaterally symmetric, involving the thalamus, and then you can also see what's called cortical ribboning uh, or thin T2 hyperintensity in the cortex. Now the pulvinar sign is hyperintensity in the pulvinar nucleus of the thalamus. So you'll see that in the dorsal thalamus. You can also see the hockey stick, which is a little bit of the dorsal medial thalamus and pulvinar together. So let's take a look at those findings. Here you see diffusion weighted imaging from a 49 year old woman with confusion and hallucinations. On diffusion, you see marked abnormalities in the basal ganglia, both involving the patamen, the caudate, and then the medial and dorsal thalamus here. Uh, if you come up a little bit higher, or actually even on this lower image, you can see areas of cortical abnormalities, so cortical T2, diffusion abnormalities, and hyperintensity. There you see the patamen on that side and the cortical ribboning there. If you move on to flare, we see the same findings. You see involvement of the patamen and caudate. Uh, the hockey stick sign is this uh, sort of shape structure here, shaped like a hockey stick. So if you have that, it looks like a hockey stick. So that's the medial thalamus and pulvinar. And so that's what people refer to as the hockey stick sign. So finally, in uh, summary, uh, those are two unusual infections you might think about that have a little bit of a distinctive and uh, unusual appearance, but that you should think about. Uh, cystocercosis is caused by tapeworm and is the most common cause of acquired seizure in Latin America. And you should suspect that whenever calcifications are present with small cystic lesions. In CJD, you should remember that most cases are not infectious, but are rather spontaneous but you should suspect this in cases with rapid progressive decline. In summary, overall, when you're thinking about intracranial infections, you might think about how you can manifest intracranial infections. It can be of the meninges or meningitis. You can get involvement of the brain parenchyma. And as we mentioned before, you have a lot of overlap between those two uh, where you will have involvement of both. When infection directly involves the ventricles, it is called ventriculitis, which has a high morbidity and mortality. If infection gets walled off, either within the parenchyma or within the subdural or epidural space, then that's an abscess. A few key confounders or key features that you have to think about. When you have a basilar meningitis, you should be thinking about unusual infections like TB or fungus, sarcoidosis, or leptomeningeal cancer. When you have enhancing lesions in HIV, there's a lot of overlap between toxoplasmosis and lymphoma. There are a couple of high morbidity and mortality situations you should be aware of, uh, particularly with uh, HSV encephalitis or medial temporal encephalitis and ventriculitis. Uh, those have a very poor prognosis, so you should be aware of that and be quick to point those out. Thanks for tuning into this series on intracranial infections. If you haven't seen all the videos, be sure to go back and check them out or check out the rest of the videos on our channel. Thanks.